It's a pleasure for me to introduce Salvador Gini. Uh, he is a sociologist, a professor of sociology at the Universitat de Barcelona and has been for many years, until 2013, the president of the Academy of Catalonia, which is the Institut de Studis Catalans. Salvador, thank you very much for giving us this occasion. A pleasure. And uh, my pleasure for allowing us to no, chat with right. you and yes, uh, yes. to give some insights into both your biography and your academic, but also more personal career yeah. uh, to young researchers. I would like to start uh, at the very beginning. Yes. Uh, that means that I would like to ask you in the first place for your origins, where you come from, um, about your family, about friends, teachers, which mm. may have given impulses to you mm. uh, and would like to know what, uh, mm. what these were. Yes. You want to know? I was born in Barcelona uh, many years ago, in 1934, and uh, I'm, uh, my parents were school teachers. Uh, it must be said that I belong to, the, to a very important tradition in, in the Spanish um, educational history, because they came from the Institución Libre de Enseñanza, which is a very important institution in Madrid, orientated towards enlightened thought, advanced educational techniques, and linked to republicanism, democracy, and progress. So they were the elite of the, they belonged to the elite of the school teachers of the Republic, which it must be said that the Spanish Republic introduced not only a change of government and brought democracy to Spain, but also it represented an effort to modernize the country and in every sense, starting with culture. So they, they're so, the, they, my parents are, were school teachers in the in the educational system, but, belo but belonged to a to a tradition which was very geared towards culture, education, and so on. So I had from from the beginning, I was surrounded by books and by a reverence towards culture. See, at home, the importance of literature, of, of knowing what was going on in the world, in the, in the world of science, or in the world of progress in general, they were obsessed by that. Not obsessed, but my sister and I, my sister was smaller than two years and younger than me, we lived in a family, four of us, I didn't have it wasn't an extended family, it was a small family. My parents had many friends in that kind of tradition, and my father had extraordinary friends, some of them exiled, who were professors. He was, as I said, a teacher, but he had friends. I don't want to do name dropping, but if I, na if I oh, drop the names, well, you can, of course. he was friendly with people Americo Castro came in and out of my house every time he came to Barcelona. And his uh, Javier Zubiri, who been in my place, Carmen Castro, the son of daughter of, was a very good friend of mine, of my parents, but me, when I went to Madrid, from the age of 17 or 18, I began to go to Madrid. I went to the Castro, to Zubiri's house, where they gave me supper. Because the contacts were extraordinary. Don Americo also came <coughs> frequently to mention too, but he had extraordinary friends. So these people were important for me because they they were curious about my progress. And and that was decisive later, especially before I went to America. But then my father was not particularly anti-clerical or he was very Republican, but he had an idea 
which I won't call obsessive, but he said, my son will not, my, my children, my daughter, they will never go. I remember, that. I was eight, nine, ten, and I, this, I remember the phrase very seriously, you will not go to a school with priests or friars. In other words, you will not go to the Jesuits, which were very near my house, very near my home. But all most children in Barcelona went to of well of well to do families or enlightened families went to schools like the Jesuits. No, I went to the Lycée Francais. Lycée Francais, the Barcelona, which was important in Madrid and Barcelona, there were two Lycées and the British school too. But in the Lycée Francais, I was very lucky when I did my I marked my baccalaureate from from the age of ten, eleven till the age of 18 I was there. There was a, a section espanol. I spoke French very fluently, but there was a section, a Spanish section, with a Spanish baccalaureate. We were very few. I remember in my year there were about seven or eight people. Then we were about 20, at the end, again, seven or eight. Uh, one or two of them are friends of mine to this day. One of my best friends is a doctor who studied with me then. He's a very well-known doctor. So I went there. Uh, before I had gone to the technical school, uh, technical alia in Sarria, which at least it was, it was Catalanist, right wing, with lots of priests there, but no, it's not a school of, was pre it was a few lay schools in Barcelona. Although uh, they took us to the Pedralbes Monastery to do our prayer first communion, but it was not the, the Catholic militancy you didn't feel it. And then I went to a lay school which was the Francoist authorities were never happy with the Liceo Francais because they suspected they were, were communists, Freemasons, whatever, all sorts of lies. But the school was liberal, republican, and some teachers, when you were 15, 14, 15, 16 years old, you could feel it, were Democrats, they didn't speak, they didn't, they didn't give speeches, political speeches. But one of them was a professor of philosophy, you must know him, or of him, Goma, Frances Goma. He taught me philosophy, 15, and when I was 15, uh, history of philosophy. You know, I had studied a bit of Descartes, and of course a few notions about enlightenment, and uh, basics about Kant, Hegel, and so on, which a view very elementary, but you got a view. He, he taught these things. We had history of philosophy. He taught basic uh, notions. And of course, that really is, is crucial. And then I didn't know what to do. At the end, I wanted to go to university. I was doubting for, between philosophy and all my best friends were in the philosophy department, uh, faculty. And, but then I realized that I had tremendous pressures, even from my family, that with philosophy I would end up being a poor teacher in uh, some, some institute, God knows where, that I had to do something. They put a lot of pressure on me and I recognized without any vocation I studied law. I wanted to study economics too, but the faculty of economics hadn't been founded. In fact, it was created at the end of my career, at the end of my five years. Yeah. But then the government forced them to start in Madrid. So I wouldn't have the resources to go to Madrid and to start uh, when I had 80 or 90 percent of my courses passed. So I studied law without any enthusiasm because I know I, I, I hated the idea of being a lawyer somewhere. But then it was a good mistake because you could do other things, uh, politics. Uh, I never had uh, political ambitions, but I got involved in politics, which is not, not the same thing. But because a few people get involved in politics without being a politician. Very few people, but I'm one of those. So I was in the first, second year. We created the Communist Party. 
Um, I said created. See, we, it didn't exist anywhere, so we formed a little cell. We declared four or five of us. We declared ourselves communists. Uh, we formed a, a, a little cell. So, if you open books about the historical, about the move, students' democratic movement, and there I appear in most uh, stories, a group of people who got together, four or five people, I can give you their names. Luis Goitisolo, one of, the, one of them, is a famous writer. Octavio Pellista is dead now. Soletura, myself, four or five. One day in the coffee house of a... We said, we are communists, and we created the party. And then, after creating the party, we looked for links with the Communist Party. We established some co connections in, with a teacher in Ostafranks, in one area of Barcelona. And uh, we knew that we were risking detention and torture. I was, because soon, spies and so on informed the police who were the communists. I was arrested in the Villa Itana, spent two nights there. I wasn't tortured, but they slapped my face a couple of times. And um, then came, uh, from Germany came a gentleman who was a Stalinist, and uh, a madman. His name was Manuel Sacristán Luzón. He came, and in question of three or four days, told us we were Deviationist, I don't know what deviated, deviation from what? Deviationist, dangerous petit bourgeois communists, and he proceeded to take over our little organization, and three or four days later, he called me privately and expelled me from the Communist Party. And I said, I have the honor to have been expelled from the Communist Party. And I told him, but who are you? We decided, who is we? Yeah. I have decided. I was expelled from the Communist Party. And then, I never deny that. It's funny because when I, when I applied for a scholarship in the United States, many, a few years later, the CIA should know that I was a communist. They didn't know. I, I, they, I, what, the one they admitted me in the United States, I don't know. Because although I was a dissident, I wasn't, never was, or have been anti-communist. I am an anti-Stalinist. Every decent person should be anti-Stalinist. But anti-communist is a noble idea. And I was going to ask you about uh, your experience. And so I, I, I left uh, the party. In the, in the US, but, but, but also, I mean, uh, coming back to your family, what, what, I mean, you studied law because the family yes, wanted you to study something decent. But the then, pressure, you, then, yes. then, then, then you became a well, communist. Well, no, I went to Germany, learned them? German, studied sociology there at mm -hmm. Cologne in the chair of the um, department of uh, uh, Professor André Koenig, mm -hmm. who was my professor there. Um, yeah, I'm a member of the Koenig Gesellschaft, and I consider him one of my teachers. And then um, doing all sorts of jobs for, to uh, earn a living. Then the scholarship was, I got a scholarship from the student union for, uh, well, to pay for my fees. And I spent a year very badly because I didn't have a, I didn't have a penny. I survived. But at the end of it, the, the American, the American, whatever it was, Agency for Students in Bonn, I went there with a Lambretta, and the girl who, who owned the Lambretta, but I was with the Lambretta, uh, went to America House with K. America House. And I applied for a scholarship in the United States. And a lady there told me, told us, all this is in German. You must improve your English immediately, but you must apply for a scholarship in Spain, because you're a Spanish citizen. So I came to Barcelona, went to the Calle Diputación. There was a, some delegation of the American 
library, no, there's in the Via Augusta, somewhere, but then there was, with a library, not bad, or was small, but I thought it was in lots of books, talk to the people there, I want to go to America, how do, we, how do I get the scholarship? I don't know. I, ex I waited for a few months, which I thought it was eternal, I thought they had forgotten me, and I got a letter, internal, at home, say we are interviewing students. It was a Fulbright Commission. So I went there. I was asked, there were three gentlemen, plus one professor, a very famous man, by the way, Pericot, Professor Pericot, who was a famous man because of a very, a very eminent, the only Spaniard was him, was a Catalan, and he was and a very eminent archaeologist of the Neolithic, Neolithic caves and things along the coast, Valencia coast. And I knew him. So they asked me lots of things. And they, mo they switched to English. I had been studying English in schools, academies and so on. And I came from Germany because I had been a colonial. My English was very funny. For instance, I was searching for words, for instance, to say but. I would say aber. So, uh, it came out in German. They all laughed. <laughs> and one of them, I don't remember, sort of very avuncularly said, look, my dear boy, don't worry, you'll pick up your English if you get this scholarship. So, about uh, between 50, uh, about 100 people applied Bilbao, through Bilbao, Seville, Barcelona and Madrid, the only the places where there were consular to go to America, but we were, se 15 were selected. But, I mean, eventually you stayed for no, more I was than selected, 20 years I was in, selected in simply for, for something. Many people were in history, literature, but the selected ones were, two or three were selected because they wanted to study American literature. So the, the, the commission thought, oh, American literature, that's good. Mind you, the Franco-American, the, 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 the treaty with 53 between America, USA, and, and the fascist regime in Spain had been signed. I sarcastically think sometimes or say, I'm fruit of that if America hadn't signed this treaty with the fascist regime, which I hated, but one, there was a clause saying there would be cultural, well, no, there, were, there was a, a, a base for the Americans in Moron, in Seville, and there was sort of uh, army and sort of uh, some sort of treaty to fight the dangerous Soviets. But there was a cultural clause that there would be exchanges between America and Spain, and America offered scholarships. There was an agency in Madrid, in the Biblioteca Nacional, on the last floor, which was a small office, which dealt with, with, uh, with the Spaniards going to America. So, of these 50 people, 15 were selected. They called us in Madrid, I called the train, El Rapido, all day the train. I went, El Rapido, the slow one. So I met these people in this floor, and they told us, you have got a Fulbright scholarship. Later I would discover this was extremely important, Fulbright. So I was a Fulbrighter. Not a bullfighter, you know, a Fulbrighter, <laughs> being Spanish. Okay, a few months later, I had to go back to Barcelona. I got a letter or two, and then finally a letter saying, on the 20th of July, we all leave for America. I mean, once, I went once, to Madrid, once. and this is uh, interesting. We were sent to the USA on board a ship. The last lot that went, not in one of the super constellation uh, planes. We went to Algeciras all night sleeping in a, in, a, in a train, and in the morning, a, a ship, the U.S. Constitution, a magnificent ship, came from Italy, stopped in Algeciras, 
next to Gibraltar. We went on a boat. We went aboard, went up. We crossed the sea. I, uh, I hear that we were the last people that went by boat. From then on, on the next year, yeah, everybody went with a scholarship to America, went by plane. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I know this is like in a film, but it is true. I spent five days on board. I saw the appearance of, he uh, crossed the, uh, the, the, the captain ordered the ship to cross the Azores because there was a new island being formed. We could see the sea bubbles, it then columns of of smoke and the beginning of the tip of a new island. And actually it was natural of course in every paper in, in the world, a new small island was appearing. So we saw it. Three days later we went to New York and I suppose the well I'm sure the captain forced the ship to enter the harbor of New York, the port of New York, at 5.36 in the morning. He was full of Italians who were going to America, plus these 15 Spaniards. We all there saw the Statue of Liberty, and then, of course, it's, he did it, because it's the entrance, the entry to the port of New York that you see in movies, you read in novels, and I saw the Statue of Liberty, but of course he was very conscious of it, and so we saw it in the very early morning, we saw the entrance to New York, which is so beautiful. I, was, I wasn't in tears, but I thought this was an extraordinary event. And then I went down, they asked me a few questions, they... Um, they thought I was carrying dangerous drugs because I had a tar of Cabello de Angel. I don't know how you say that in English. Angel's hair, which is my mother had given me. And I said, well, I can eat it in front of you. So I put a spoon and I, I uh, said, this isn't harmless. This was a chap in the entrance who was a, a customs officer. I mean, one, once you arrived... And then they sent me to you, Yale. You I chose a university. I could have chosen. This is crazy. Harvard, Yale, or I don't know what. Mm -hmm. For the summer. But I could stay. I filled the papers. I thought Yale sounded more interesting. So I spent three months in Yale. But at Yale, there was a man who asked me, do you want to stay? Do you want to go and study sociology? And by then I knew that the most important department of sociology in the world that was the way of putting it, for Chicago. So you went there. And he said, would you like to stay at Yale? Yale had a professor whom later I knew, I met him, very nice man, small department, Harvard, so-so, with a very famous sociologist there, he doing more, more sociological theory, history of ideas than anything, but the great department in the world admired everywhere Chicago they tell me well you want to go to Chicago we'll apply for see if you go but it's difficult you make your work you will have to study statistics and but I wanted to go to Chicago it was the, the most and at the end I got a train ticket which then I saw the this timetable that was absurd so I took a, a bus the a Greyhound bus like everybody else, I went to Chicago. I went to university, the main office, I'm so-and-so, I'm a full writer, I got a full ride scholarship, yes, 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 I feel a few good. They assigned me to International House, which is still down, a beautiful, um, magnificent residence for students, called International House, founded by Rockefeller, when the, more or less when the university was founded, end of the 19th century very good residence where I spent a few months and I came back a couple of times but then I lived nearly five years in in apartments flats we would say in English with other students uh, I spent five years in Chicago with my masters and my PhD in Chicago I'm a doctor of the University of Chicago in sociology no less and with Islam. 
the exquisite we think we are, the cream of the cream. But then you stayed for are. more than 20 years in English-speaking No, countries. I spent 24 years in England. 24 years? No, and then I spent uh, my countries. four years in Chicago, which were the best years of my life, uh, studying, sinning, lots of sinning. Uh, the girls were very attractive, and, um, and I couldn't resist. Uh, uh, and I spent, and at the end I could have renewed it. But I, then, my supervisor, the PhD supervisor, was a professor of Chicago. I had then the most fantastic professors I had in my life, and I spoke like I talked to you. I mean, people who received me privately. Hayek, was what, I'm not a Hayekian, but of course, he taught me. I have to present a couple of papers to him. Strauss, or Strauss. I did a course on Aristotle with him, and Strauss gave me one of the greatest lessons I've given in my life. I will give to you, tell you what. Strauss, because I was the first term, I studied with Strauss, basic, um, the Hobbes and a few other. Uh, he has a small book on Hobbes, marvelous, by the way, which we all, I bought it, I have it at home. Then Hayek. And then this man, Edward Shields, one of the best sociologists, then took me under his, um, said, OK, I'll direct it. He supervised my PhD thesis. I got an MA by examination, I could, not by thesis, by exam. The exam lasted three days, but this is the Chicago style. They lock you up in a room with all the books, the chuletas, we say. You can bring all the stuff you they, have, they, they ask you big questions, like migrations in the West. Uh, Marx, compare Marx to Auguste Comte. Describe and compare and give papers. You wrote long papers. Um, things like that. Uh, and you had to reply to these big the days. You, they would lock you up in the room. And in the end, they will give you. Um, and, so, they let, so and I got a good degree. Uh, it was exactly the final. It was not a figure like on 10 or a 9 or an 8. No. Uh, you could get a fail, a pass, or a high pass. I don't know what happened. This is, this is the Chicago style in the Committee on Social Thought. And that was examined, I suppose, by Hannah Arendt, Edward Shields, Ifridi Hayek. They were the committee. Arendt, I had followed her courses. There were about 25 people. I have written things on Hannah Arendt and uh, mentioned the fact that I was. I am the only disciple of Hannah Arendt. No, I have the Arendtian people, people who know much more than me. Here in Barcelona, there are two, three experts on Hannah Arendt. But I have the good fortune that I, I took courses with her. And in fact, why, I took why, one course. Why, why after uh, so many years in the US and then yeah. the UK did you come back? Was it this sense of belonging? Oh, because why, this, this kind of can only be explained by being crazy because I I then came here I spent a year my professor went to King's College in 89 or 88 89 you came back right no I came and when when I came in 64 65 I spent a year here he was at King's he was a double he had a double chair double one in Chicago and one in King's and he said, why come here? What do you do in Barcelona? You, I was progressing with my, my PhD. I sent him a copy, and he said it was rubbish, you are very slow, come here and finish it here. So I went to King's, and Lord Annan, Lord, who was the, che the mm, provost title, medieval title, of the college, received me in his room, and he, and he said, look, we'll give you 
my scholarship was didn't cover anything, but he gave me the privilege of sitting, of un lunching and eating and all that in the college. By the way, in the high table where the professors brought, because all the PhD students would sit on a high table. And then he gave me, for one year, but I spent three or four, he gave me rights to stay in the college, to sleep there. Actually, I never did, for, for a simple reason. Although I take sh took showers and baths there, which were very important for me, because the college was full. But they had houses outside in the college, in a, in a, in a place called Shelley Road, Shelley El Poet. Shelley Road was a small street which belonged, uh, near all the houses belonged to kings. So I got, a f I got a flat there. I had to share it with two other students. And I was very happy finishing my PhD. But then I got, um, I got a job at Reading University. It was advertised, I didn't know. But like everything, like some prof this man, this professor said, look here, what the hell are you here finish? There is a job as a lecturer, assistant lecturer. So I went to Reading. I had an interview with a couple of people, the dean of the faculty, professor of political science, and one sociologist and somebody in history, no, in Italian history. Luigi Meneghello, then became a good friend of mine, an eminent writer, by the way. So they asked me a few questions, and they gave me a job with very little, no, no, I, I had less than 90 pounds a month, which which I more or less lived. Then I got married, and we couldn't live with 90 pounds. We needed 200, 300 pounds. But they renewed my my t my job, my teaching lectureship, young lecturer, and I and I stayed this four or five years. I renewed the permission. And then I got the, uh, from there. I got a job in Lancaster. I simply got jobs with so many rich experiences. The first one. Let me let me just ask a, a final question. Mm. Uh, what would you say if your grandson, your uh, great-grandson or nephew comes yes. now to you and says, look, I would like to go into research. Would you be happy to teach as no, a grandfather? You should what, go what into would business, you? but not the teaching. You're going to be poor all your life, and academic life is what it is. And I don't know, it's very... But expensive. if he has the strong desire to do research, what would oh, your recommendations be? No, no, be? wonderful. I think research is fantastic. Let and what, what, what recommendations could you give him or her or also young researchers no, to do what in the, general? The, no, I think there is nothing better than that. I mean, there is nothing more noble than science. I mean, it's marvelous. I say yes all the time. In my case, I became a sociologist, but I became so involved in the history of ideas that I became I was interested in the history of sociology. My thesis on the idea of mass society, the massification of the horrible world, world of the world, is basically a history of ideas, thesis of evolution along. So the evolution of starting with Tocqueville is a theories of democracy, of mass democracy. And the whole thing was historical, and uh, I became so engrossed in the history of ideas that at a certain time, foolishly, I decided to history to write a history of a, of, of 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 the social thought, social thought. Why? Well, I had read Machiavelli, Florentine history, not so, not only the the usual thing. Uh, I had read Rousseau, I simply devoured Rousseau, Machiavelli, Tocqueville I read at a very early stage when no one, had no merit in this, but in this country, in Spain, but no, no, nobody knew who he was. Uh, I was reading Machiavelli more than Marx, I read some Marx, 
but uh, but it's boring. Bach is very boring, turgid. Yeah. But mm, these other thinkers, I read. Some I didn't like. Diltag, you know, all these kind of German woolly writers, and I read. And I read and read. So your recommendation is basically reading. Reading, when I I think if you the best thing about, uh, about it, the best thing the best way to learn anything is to write a book about it. If you write the book, and I wrote the history of social thought. Well, it's been I've been lucky. It's thirteen, no less than thirteen editions have appeared, and every four or five years I've renewed it. In nineteen eighty one, for instance. I had a scholarship, by the way, to Yale, although I had to spend only three weeks there, uh, three months. But I was invited by Yale, one sabbatical, and I went there with my wife and my children. 1981, my children were as small. And I, for instance, spent the whole year polishing the second or the third edition of Histor Historia del Pensamiento Social. Yeah, but you know that unfortunately today for young researchers there's no time for writing books because no. you're supposed to publish high impact papers oh, I don't know, one after the other. I used what to do you read, think about I that? Read. You see, I, I, I read Tocqueville and I read, I, I, I usually when I write, I'm not a specialist, but I write on people I read. Even Ortega said, well, I don't like Ortega, but if I have to speak of the revolt of the masses or España y Vertebrada, I read those books. Hippolytan uh, or Turkem or great thinkers, I'm interested in, to this day, I like that kind of stuff. Benedetto Croce, Cataneo, I read Italian thinkers. I'm a great, great admirer of Italian, uh, Italian culture. So, uh, I read them and underline those books, they are all underlined and with notes. But it doesn't mean makes doesn't make me a scholar of anything. Um, because I met people at Reading, for instance, I remember, who were specialists on one thinker or two or or one school and really much knew much more than me. But I had the the aplomb, the cheek call it what you like, to read, a, write a huge book, History of Social Thought. Of course, I read the Republic, Plato's Republic, I have two of the best editions, Jowett's edition I have at home, marvelous, but I have other, Conra, a Confront, I have two or three Confront translations, it's very good. I have um, some books like the Republic, I must have read it three or four times, but I know the statesman, El Politico, read once, and I had enough. So it's very uneven. Some writers I know very well, some thinkers, others not so much. And uh, with, uh, I simply wrote this, published this book, which I, and then monographs and things, but I was, my image, public, public image in universe, was that I was a sociologist. Even I wrote an introduction to sociology, which with an uh, effort to make it well balanced, unbiased. It's not a Marxist book, it's not a functionalist book, it's not any school, it's just even. And I was surprised because this book was translated into French, it had three editions in France, four or five in America and um, uh, England, two in uh, Scandinavian countries, one in Japan, in Italy four. I never got a penny from Italy because they are a bunch of crooks. It, it was it sold very well in Italy. I, mean, I know that for instance La Sapienza in Rome, it was a textbook. Well. Dove sono i quadrini? No, they never pay. <laughs> never. And here, occasionally, Edición Chantados, who has the rights for Spanish, Catalan, what have you, 
occasionally gave me some little money. They said, Here, look, 20,000 pesetas with ro royalties. I think that's a, that's a fate and a concern Fantastic. that you share so with I young researchers I could also. drink a coffee out of my books. But uh, that was very successful. Sociology was successful. Sold like hotcakes everywhere in Spain, America, Latin America. In some places, well, the same thing happened to the history of social thought. In the Dominican Republic, simply they, they photocopied it, it multiplied, and they sold it over America, Latin America without copyrights, without royalties, nothing. Pirates, they are pirates. <laughs> Salvador, um, I think we have to thank you very much okay. for sharing all okay, these personal memories of yeah. uh, life which was, is dedicated to research. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much and for being here I've, with us. Funnily enough, I've done some sociological research, um, macro sociology. Well, it's like economics, microeconomics in microeconomics. I've done macro for Europe, two or three books published by Radisson, King and Paul on European societies. Here in Catalonia I've done big, some big um, research projects with questionnaires or what have you. One of the books on Catalonia is huge, four kilos and 2200 grams, with a team of people, sociologists from Barcelona, a team, three or four or five people, but about 12 writers wrote, each one wrote a chapter. I have the book here, I'm mean, so in, I don't bring it to you, but doesn't no, matter, it's later, later next room see. to the right, is, you can see it. And I want to do that again, but I am split between research, macro sociology, micro doesn't interest me. Small question is, I think micro sociology is very interesting. You can do sociology of a school or a neighborhood, but I've done these macro things, mm. which is also as justifiable as the other. And, um, and in parallel, I have this weakness for history of ideas. You were, that's what I. Oh. And the rest Thank of you. my life, you again, suppose I, I live three minutes or three months. Or 20 years, I don't know. <laughs> if I'm all right, I continue to do we that. We hope that you still can contribute a lot to science. No, and, and occasionally I write the odd essay, non-historical. I just finished one okay. on rationality. Great. Finished yesterday. Uh, literally, no, I, I, I revised it. Well, so research. It's got 20, 20 pages. Is a life and I sent it to a journal. In Madrid, the yeah, occasional, you know. Now I have to peer review it. We'll see what, but what comes out of that. Neither. Well, that's yes. Well, yes. <laughs>